What's up guys, this is Leo from Billfish Gear. I just wanted to give you guys a pr- little intro before we get started with the latest podcast with John Duffy. This will actually be a re-upload in celebration of our latest campaign called The Bill Fisher. But before we get into that, I just wanted to give everyone kind of a background as to how this campaign got created. And the way it got started was that we had a new shirt that we had created with a button, as I'm sure most of you have seen by now. And it was a performance shirt, right? So the question was, all right, we want to give it a name that really has performance built into it. And for some reason, I just kept on going back to the word Bill Fisher. Now, as most of anyone who's kind of in the debt bait Bill Fish world, everyone knows that Bill Fisher is the name of one of the best boats on the planet, right? That's John Duffy's boat. So, you know, the first thing I did was I, I reached out to John um, and I asked, hey, you know, we want to name our product the Bill Fisher. Are you, are you okay with that? And he was, you know, super pumped, super thrilled, super honored. And obviously I was honored because, I mean, you know, the reputation speaks for itself. And I mean, I just want to give a shout out to John, who has been so, so helpful with everything. And to give everyone kind of a context, I figure I'd just give a little backstory of the Bill Fisher itself as a team, as far as I've experienced it. So the first time I really heard about the boat Bill Fisher and, and, and John and his team, um, was when a family member of mine was fishing in Costa Rica on the Tar Heel with Captain John Bayless. And, you know, I, I got this information relayed, but John was telling a family member of mine about how John Duffy trolls his quit chains as far as humanly possible. Pretty much in the same position as regular people run their long rigger baits, right? And I always thought that, that was fascinating. And you could see it because there's a video um, of John running the Tar Heel and to John Duffy on your Tar Heel in Costa Rica on YouTube. And you could see that his squid chains were so far away. Anyway, so that was intriguing, right? So I never forgot, forget that. Um, and a few years later, I was actually in Juan Cheese, North Carolina, and John Bayless, I was visiting the yard, and they just completely redid the Agitator, which at the time was a 52-foot Scarborough boat. And it was gorgeous, right? And as most of us know who've kind of studied and have been involved with this industry. They went and went on to win Costa Rica, the Triple Crown Championship, two years in a row, and just complete domination, right? Since then, I've just been very much fascinated with this, this team and how they operate. And the coolest thing about how they operate is it's a family fishing team. And that's really unique, right? There's sure that they have, you know, they have a program, but it really is a family team, which is really, really interesting. So that's kind of the backstory of, of, of how I kind of first learned about them and it's what's even cooler is that since then he started building his own boats um there's company duffy boat works and those things are just spectacular um so i encourage everyone to go check out duffy boat works you know while listening to this podcast because especially their latest boat the dem boys is a true work of art so shout out to john um he's been incredibly helpful he supported the brand he gave us the green light connected us with his marketing team to help assist with images and everything and it's just been a tremendous support from him and, and everyone else so yeah make sure to go check, check out Duffy Bart Works and go check out the Bill Fisher shirts we're super super excited for everyone to try them um, it's a hooded long sleeve with a button that kind of closes and adds for, adds for extra protection it's the first that the first shirt of this kind that we've done um, and I cannot wait to hear what everyone thinks and yeah hopefully we uh, we're, we love our product so hopefully we did you know the name right Enjoy the podcast, and as always, thank you for listening to State of Sport Fishing. We really caught 58. 58 my yeah. mother caught it on the way home, but I had already told everybody we caught 57, so yeah. there was no way to go back on it. Yes, indeed. So here we have... It was August 30th, right? August 30th. 2010. 2010. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Yeah. So I have my log and how many bites and who was on board. So we started fishing at 8.08 a.m., and we immediately oh. missed one <laughs> two minutes into the day. And then we raised a large blue marlin. And then we missed two more white marlin. <laughs> and then we saw two more white marlin that would not bite. And how did it start out? Like, what was the origin of the story? Too much alcohol. Really? <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> if God wanted us to have five glass boats, he would have given us five glass trees. It's, it's for fishermen. It's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends. I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. 
and then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit as yeah. far as if I can remember uh-huh. correctly. <laughs> Hello, everybody. This is Anthony from the State of Sport Fishing and the Captain of the Blood Money and Hook Optics. Tonight, we have uh, John Duffy of Duffy Boatworks and former captain of the uh, Bill Fisher and the Agitator program. Um, John, thank you for joining us, and we appreciate your time. We know you're a busy, busy, busy guy. So, um, yeah, just tell us a little bit about yourself. And I, I obviously know a lot of a lot about you and the program. And but tell everybody else kind of how you got started and how we how you got to where you're at, which is pretty pretty insane. <laughs> yeah, I uh, initially lost my mind. Anyways, uh, John Duffy, I grew up. Uh, outside of Washington, DC, but my family has fished out of ocean city, Maryland since before I was born. Um, we grew up on the docks in ocean city, running around, getting to fish on any boat that we could. Uh, my dad ran the boat when we were children and mom and dad taught us how to fish. And we just fished as a family unit ever since, you know, we were babies. I mean, literally my dad used to tell me that the first time he took me offshore was on a 25 Bertram in a car seat that he would tie down to the bridge of a 25 Bertram with gas cans in the cockpit to make sure that he could make it back from the Baltimore Canyon. Uh, and my older brother, you know, started fishing and worked in the cockpit before I did, obviously, because he's older. And Jeremy was a great fisherman, great mate, ran the boat a little bit before I did. Um, so when we were growing up and we used to, we were fortunate enough that when we were young kids, I guess you could say we were fortunate enough that my parent, our parents would leave us in Ocean City and they would go back <laughs> home and work. And our role models slash babysitters slash guardians were the charter boat captains in Ocean City. So you had guys like Mitch Pearson, Eric Blanks, Mark Hill, Bob Gower, Jimmy Garner. Uh, they looked after us. And every day we would just hop on a different charter boat or a different boat and we would go fishing with those guys. And I would bounce around fishing on headboats with Monty Hawkins. I'd fish on the princess. Whenever there was a tuna chunking overnighter, 36 hour trip, Bob Gower would be like, Johnny, I need you to come on the, the head boat. And off we'd go. And I'd, I'd just go throw chunks for a couple of days and run the head boat when Bob was taking a nap. And I can remember being like 14 years old and I was running the princess and we were up outside the Wilmington Canyon and you know, it's big 77 foot head boat. And I was sitting at the wheel in the wheelhouse and Bob was sleeping on the couch behind me. And this guy comes up, knocks on the door. So he comes in and he's like, Hey, uh, where's the captain? I was like, you're talking to him. And he's like, you're a kid. Get out of here. What are you doing in here? And I was like, no, Bob's asleep. But I just grew up loving to fish and being lucky enough that so many of these guys that were really talented fishermen took the time to teach me how to do it. And I learned from, you know, the best in the business. You got, the guys that were mates then that are great captains now and the captains that were incredible captains then that taught us so much. And uh, so by the time I was like 16, I was really confident in my boat handling abilities. And uh, you know, my parents would, at that point they had kind of taken, taken over as anglers. And so me and Jeremy would take turns running the boat or being the mate. And on weekends, we would fish with my family. And in the tournaments, we would fish with my family. And then during the week, I would fish with other guys. You know, Mitch would always take me. I I mean, I always bring up Mitch because he was, you know, one of the really important mentors I had when I was young. Uh, You know, he was mating on the, he made it for Butch Davis and he would, he would get me and I'd go fishing with them and we'd go chunk tunas or troll for blue fins at the hot dog. And then when Mitch was running the hammer, I would go on there all the time. And man, we had some incredible, it was, it was incredible. It was a great way to grow up. I was very fortunate to get to spend that much time on the ocean at such a young age with great people to learn from, you know, these were guys that were fishing in Mexico and the Bahamas and Florida and Stewart. So learning how to rig dredges and learning how to rig teasers and fishing with lighter leader. And that was kind of when, you know, numbers bill fishing was, I feel like really starting to take off in the early nineties because those guys had already been to those places and done that and knew the tactics that we are still using today. You know, that was when it was really starting out. Uh, I don't know. Do you want me to keep going or you want me? Yeah. keep going. 
Uh, Don't be so nervous. You're fine. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're never you're never nervous about anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> so we started, you know, we had our family's boat it was a 50 foot post. And I can remember one day we ran down to the Norfolk and it was the first day that I'd ever seen white Marlin ball bait. And like, I always think about this story and Jeremy and I were downstairs, dad's running the boat and we were like two for 18 on white Marlin and we couldn't get them to bite it out of the bait balls. And I just remember being in tears in the cockpit because we weren't catching any of these damn <laughs> things. And uh, cause we had never seen that, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah, for sure. home, there's Marlin's cutting bait and we got freaking nine inch mullets on the flat lines with nine OJ hooks and a one ounce chin lead. And we've got them on 50 pens. <laughs> Our average was poor. Our tactics were poor. We were still <laughs> learning. Uh, and then we flew down to Mexico and we fished with Johnny Mac on the pipe dream. And, you know, we started doing stuff like that, traveling a little bit, learning, you know, better tactics and, that made us better fishermen. And I can remember like the, another good thing. I remember the very first day we ever caught double digits, white Marlin fishing. Yeah. I was 16 years old running the 50 foot post and Mark Hill hammer was running the liquidator and Dave Fields was his mate. <laughs> and I think they caught like seven or eight that day. We caught more than the liquidator, which was like, Holy like, shit. Like catching more of the bill fisher now. <laughs> And the hammer came down the dock and he was like, oh, you, you little bastards, you caught more than us. He was, you know, ranting and raving, running around like a lunatic, yelling, you better get some more fuel in that thing. You better go tomorrow. You got to go tomorrow. I'm going to whoop your ass tomorrow. And uh, just that was, you know, an incredible day to catch double digits. And to, I think that day we were probably, you know, the top boat for the day for releases. And, oh, man, it was pretty crazy. Considering that I think that the next year we won top private boat. And we had 19 releases for the season. Wow. Oh, yeah. That, that seems unfathomable right now, but who knows? It, it's all, it's always possible, you know? Um, what about you? You stuck me there. Um, I was about to ask you about how it be Jeremy's the older one, how it became that he was the, uh, that you became, you were the, you ended up being the captain and not him. And <laughs> I've always well, wondered that at moments it was really contentious. <laughs> But at moments, <laughs> it's very contentious. A lot. Uh, Jer was really good at hooking fish, like r- insanely good at hooking fish. And we were J hook fishing then, yeah. but he had a touch, you know, and he was really, really good at, you know, he loved rigging baits and he did a great job and he was super particular. And so, I mean, I think, you know, of course he would tell you that he, he could do it better. Yeah. rigging the baits hooking the fish basically everything and driving the boat too <laughs> and driving the boat. so i dad wanted to start catching fish mom wanted to start catching fish when we were little mom and dad used to run the boat like dad would put the baits out mom would drive the boat and then we would hook a fish and mom would fight the fish and dad would run the boat and then when we had to kill it dad would come down and i would go up or jeremy would go up or mom if we were fighting the fish mom would run the boat while we were fighting fish sometimes yeah uh, so it just kind of, it kind of happened because Jeremy was really a great mate. I mean, he, you know, he, he was really good at it. And so I just started driving the boat and then it worked out. Okay. Yeah. I started fish and he, he ran the boat when I was finishing up college, he ran the boat for a year and he had, he did a great job. And he, I just think that, you know, he wanted to go back and work at the company and it wasn't really his thing. Yeah. And so. I finished school. I started running the boat full time. And at that point, you know, we had the 60 Scarborough uh, and that was my first like kind of forte into boat building. I was definitely not an active participant at that point. I was just along for the ride and learning, you know, from Ricky Scarborough and Ricky Jr. And uh, man, that boat was great. You know, it was a a great platform to really kind of learn on. And Scott Walker ran it for the first season that we had it and learned a lot from him, from fishing in the Keys with him and you know, live baiting. And then I guess that was my first summer out of school. Mitch was running the Nuco too. And in the fall, he had brought the boat to ocean city that summer. And in the fall, he was like, Hey, you should come with me to Panama and Costa Rica for, you know, the winter. And we were building the six, we were getting ready to build the 66. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. So I shipped out with him and we traveled down there, spent the winter fishing in Panama. And that was him and Chris Martin and an amazing experience. It's 
probably like the, I mean, it was, it's still a long ways away, but back then it must have been the end of the earth. Dude, it was awesome. Yeah. I mean, you know, we traveled on our own bottom and we would fish like 27 days straight and then Ed and Sue would fly home for a couple days and, and then we'd take a little break and then we'd start up again. Our first month of fishing, we caught like 450 sails, mar like I can't remember, six or eight marlins and being on the hook in Panama and, and living that, you know, that was really incredible. And uh, then we went to Costa Rica in the spring and fished out of there and had incredible fishing. Where'd you fish out of there? I mean, obviously, Los Los, oh, was it was it there already? The marina was there. There was one dock. I got you. And it had like ten slips on it, and then there was no like the hookup building. None of those buildings were there. Yeah. Just a, a construction trailer and a gravel parking lot, and it said "Future Home of Los Angeles Resort and Marina." That's amazing. It was amazing, and there yeah. was a little, you know, there there was still a little charter fleet and uh, in the bay, and and we would fish. It was it was pretty incredible to fish then uh, down there. Did you always know that like from a kid that you just wanted to be a captain? Like that was kind of just in your mind. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, I did. Awesome. I mean, just growing up on the dock and being around those guys and I just was ate up with the fishing, you know, I couldn't get enough of it. I would fish during the day and then we would come in and we, I'd help clean the boat, you know, chamois the boat and I'd go down the dock and I'd get my spinning rod and then I'd walk down to Shantytown at the end of the fishing <laughs> center and I'd catch speckled trout all night under the bow of the, the princess nice and then go back to the boat and go to sleep that's pretty uh, yeah pretty so <laughs> i you know after fishing with mitch and chris on the nuco i came home and i moved to wanchies because we were building the 66 and i basically stayed there for the entire construction process of that and that's where i really like got passionate about the boat building and how they were put together and why everything was put together the way it was and and junior ricky jr and i like it was so funny, like trying to change little subtle things on the boat and trying to convince Big Rick that we wanted <laughs> to do this stuff. And Big Rick would just look at me and be like, no. And I was like, oh, come on, Rick, it's going to be awesome. You know, let's change the shape here and let's do this. And I want the helm console to have the same crown as the deck and, and actuate it as one piece. And, and I want, you know, more shape in the front of the cabin. And can we do that? And he'd always just be like, no. <laughs> uh but it was an incredible experience getting to learn from him and learn from Ricky Jr. And, you know, the guys that worked in the shop, uh, it was awesome. I mean, I loved it. And yeah. learning, you know, he, he was, I was fortunate that like when we lofted the hull and he had all the string lines set up and he had the batten set up and getting to see how, you know, vi like learning how to visualize what the string lines meant and what the battens were showing us for how much dead rise we were going to have in the bottom. And, you know, going over the plans for the boat, which the plans for the boat were drawn on a sheet of plywood. There was no like paper <laughs> plan. There was no computer drawings. It was just it all in Rick's mind. And yeah. he would say, well, how big a stateroom do we want to put in the bow? Is it going to be a V berth? And I say, yeah. He's like, all right, well then we need to push these battens out a little bit and let's carry a little bit more, you know, beam at the chine. And, and then, we would say, well, we really want to keep it narrow at the time. So we have that ride. And so it was all just by the rack of the eye, you know, yeah, I mean, yeah. he look at it and look at the string lines and look at the battens and he could visualize the entire hall with, and there's nothing in the barn at this point, but string lines and battens. Yeah. And, and to learn that and be able to see it was, you know, yeah. I mean, it's a, it's, I mean, that's how they build boats back then. <laughs> well, well, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Again, once again. Yeah. How much, uh, going back to when you were a kid, how much did the, the community here in Ocean City play into the fact of, of just like falling in love with, with fishing and, and just kind of how it is around here? I mean, sometimes it's a little contentious, but for the most part, it's pretty awesome. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, growing up with, like I was talking about earlier, with the guys that were the captains, then it was a huge influence on me to become a charter, you know, a fisherman. Yeah. And, you know, you, you fall in love with the lifestyle and the traveling and there's great parts of it. There's bad parts of it, but that's, I feel like that's with any path in life. Uh, I think that, you know, it's hard not to fall in love with the lifestyle a little bit. I mean, yeah. All these places <laughs> and see incredible things and like every day is a new day. Yes. You're going to go fishing, but you never know what you're going to see. And that's what I love about it. And as long as you're prepared for it, you yeah. never know what's going to happen. <laughs> but you, you know, you just hope you're prepared for whatever comes your way. Uh, the community here in ocean city has been, you know, it's a great fishing community. Uh, I think there's parts of it that are completely different than they used to be, you know, growing up charter fishing and fishing with the guys. Then it was the same people 
every year on that certain day. Like, you know, back then people had their day in the calendar. That's the day they went offshore. Then, you know, as the internet came along and people started reading internet fishing reports, I think that kind of really changed the entire nature of charter fishing to where people were like, well, I don't want to go fishing on July 8th. I want to wait until the fishing's good. Yeah. Where before it was just, that was their day. They booked that day every single year and whatever happened happened. They were going fishing. Now people are more worried about how much they're going to catch on their charter. Like how many tunas are we going to catch? Are we going to catch our limit? I don't want to go unless we're catching a limit. Can we kill 60 mahis today? I don't know. Can we kill that white marlin? Or all of them. Yeah, right? I mean, <laughs> Why'd you let that go? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, I mean, it's, I, that's a, you've seen it changed over a much longer period, but I kind of started where you could actually like kind of see the change where it was more, you know, there's, there's a, just a handful of charter boats and most of the, most of the jobs in the industry around here are all mostly private boats, you know? Right. And, and it, there's been, you know, a shift from the owner operator chart. There's a lot of owner operator charter boats now, but they're different mm -hmm. than they used to be. Yeah. You know, these are a lot, there's a lot more people in the industry now that run the boats in the summertime and, and don't fish year round. Yeah. Uh, and back then there was mostly the boats that were the really, you know, that were charter boats fished year round and they moved from here to Stewart or Palm beach and they had their Mexico trip and they had their Bahamas trip and there was a circuit for the charters, you yeah. know? And, and I think when we were chartering, I mean, you know, we had our certain clients that fish with us in the summertime up yeah, there, yeah. follow us wherever we went. They would fish yeah. with us, Palm beach. They would fish with us again in Mexico. They would fish with us when we traveled to the Bahamas. Yeah. That's definitely a different, different, different time than what we have now. Not that this is bad. I, I, oh, I, absolutely. It's, I mean, yeah. everything changes and yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's just different now and and i think people now you know the world's gotten smaller yeah it's like you can look on the internet and be like oh hey they're catching them in costa rica well let's look on southwest we can find a ticket we'll fly out of baltimore and they fly down there and go fishing for a weekend in costa rica yeah. versus you know it used to be halfway around the world yeah. just flying down there for the day yeah um you talked about the 66 and that was kind of when uh, I don't I don't know when the Prather came to the at the end of end of the 66 and at the beginning of the and uh, during the 62, mo almost most of the time on the 62 or not most of the time, but a lot of it. Mm -hmm. um, that was a pretty amazing relationship. And you guys were pretty oh, pro yeah. prolific back then. I mean, when you got I don't remember much time during the 66 Scarborough because I just was young. But I think the second year or second year I was working in Ocean City, you got the 62 and that I felt like that that started a, a, a pretty prolific time for the, your program. Yeah, I mean, we we had good fishing when we had the 60, you know, Willie Zimmerman was my mate on the 60 <laughs> Scarborough. Willie and I have been fishing together since we were like 12. Yeah. So that's been a pretty incredible relationship in the for over the years me and willis and he used to go with me to the bahamas on the 60 scarborough like in the late 90s early 2000s and we were kids yeah. and we'd go over there and be fishing in harbor island and fishing out of nassau fishing in chubb and uh then you know and chris horning would fish with us some and and then we got the 66 and willie was the mate on there the first year that we took it to mexico and then uh chris would fish with us a little bit and then prather started fishing with us and andy helms andy, made it yeah. after that and then prather Either started this it was two years before we sold the 66 he fished on the 66 we fished on there two seasons in mexico and, and in ocean city um but man on the 60 we that thing used to raise some fish and we would always pretty much be in contention for you know the marlin club awards like for top private boat on that boat the 66 we had a couple good years but you know that there was like a lot of strong competition when we had the 66 you had ronnie running the dac and you had uh you know, the Cerveza fishing mm -hmm. out of Ocean City then and Butch running that. And man, it was steep competition. It was cr crazy. And, you know, the boats didn't used to fish as much then. Then we got the 62 Spencer and P and I worked together on there. I mean, P, P and I fished together for seven years. At least that, yeah. Yeah, and Chris was with us for a few of those. And uh, then... P, you know, started his inshore business and he, that's been incredible. And, and Chris fished with me for a couple of years after that, just he and I, and that's, uh, how yeah. I remember the, the, the couple incredible days I was able to fish with you guys in 2010 and, and Jair said something about, we wouldn't have been able to do this in, in, 
if we didn't go to Mexico and basically practice like you, I mean, yeah, I, I was there with you guys in Mexico. It was fucking training camp, man. Yeah. That's and, what it is. Like, yeah. How important is that for a program or just for an angler? Oh my gosh. I think fishing in Isla Harris is indispensable. If you want to compete at the highest level, you're not like fishing in Mexico in the wintertime teaches you how to catch multiples and number fishing <laughs> in rough conditions with very picky fish. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can go fishing in places where it's flat, calm and the fish are biting and that's awesome. But like, you got to work for your bites in Mexico, whether you're fishing on the birds or straight up trolling and your technique has to be, you know, on point, your dredges have to look right. Everything has to be working together. Your anglers are constantly working there because I mean, you're prospecting, you're, you're winding in a turn, you're, you're changing the way the spread looks behind the boat, depending on how you're fishing. Like if you're fishing on the birds, you don't want your outside rigger crossing your inside rigger. So we, a lot of times we'll pull that down and then all of a sudden you're fishing a long rigger, a short rigger and a flat line. And you're sinking baits past the dredge, trying to get more bites and uh, staying on a ball of fish and, and fishing, you know, cutting, fishing on cutting sails. And I just think it teaches your anglers how to, how to work their baits and get more bites. And I think it teaches a captain, you know, how to a stay on the fish that are biting B keep your guys getting bit and staying, you know, you got to keep fishing even while you're catching. Yeah. Right. So that's how you're going to catch the most. You're, you're, you're constantly in a, in a circle and trying to keep your stuff untangled and keep your teasers in the water or your dredges in the water so that you're in position and you have baits going past them to keep enticing more fish in. And I mean, Look, the best teaser is the fish that you have on. He's out there fighting and, and thrashing around and puking. And other sails are gobbling that up. And you see it up here with the white marlins too, you know, a fish jumping. If he's puking squid, a lot of times you'll see one slipping around under him or you make a turn and go by him and sink a bait and you get another bite. So it's, it's just constantly teaching you how to turn one fish into two or two into three or four into five. Yeah. And that's the whole, that's the fun of it for me. You know, I just want to see how many you can catch. Yeah, that's I mean, it's a it's an overall mentality, would you say about, you know, everybody's more or less got to be on the same page and you can't do that unless you're unless you're, you know, you've practiced somewhere. I mean, you could try it to do it up here, but, you know, when you're lots. and when you're when you're having that having that day, it seems like even if it's not a tournament up here, it kind of feels like the pressure's on, you know, and you, wanna, yeah. you know, you got to have the confidence to stay in the turn and, and keep, keep baits out where, yeah. you know, you don't get that confidence. You know, I mean, I've had days up here where shit's not going right. And I'm like, just, let's just stop and just get this one. Cause this, we're never going to get another, oh, absolutely. Another <laughs> you know, you, there are days where you have to like weigh your options and be yeah, like, yeah. they keep falling off. Yeah. Well, instead of instead of risking the one falling off every single time which has happened like when 10 in a row fall off stop trying to get a second one to catch one double right let's yeah. just catch singles all day if we yeah. gotta pick at them uh, like i used to always say we're getting singled to death <laughs> yeah. uh and but like fishing in mexico and fishing somewhere where it's rough and that's why i think like the east coast fishermen in general i mean oh boy shouldn't say this, say but- it Come on, people. The East Coast guys, we're used to running 100 miles to have three freaking bites. So when we go other places where the fishing is good and you don't have to run as far, or it's flat calm. People think we're insane because we're like, ah, we're <laughs> wide open, we're running out there. We want to be there first. We're going to fish the longest because it's, you know, it's special to us when we get there. It's, yeah. You know, you know, and we're willing to, if we're willing to run a hundred miles to catch three stupid white Marlins, just think what we're going to do when we can run 40 miles and catch 50 or 60 yeah. every day. Yeah, that's yeah, I mean, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. So, and moving like, I, in, I remember a really, really good fisherman that never fishes up here in Ocean City came up like this is probably 15 years ago for the White Marlin Open. He called me and he's like, Hey, where do you think we should go? I said, Let's go to the Spencer Canyon. And he's like, What is that? And I was like, It's, it's up north. It's not that far. It's fine. <laughs> so, anyways, we run up there. It's rough as shit southwest. It takes like five and a half hours to get home. We get in and he's like, I don't understand why anyone on earth <laughs> wants to fish out of Ocean City, Maryland. And I was like, what do you mean, Ray? And he's like, I had one bite all day. And I was like, yeah, but we had four bites. It's fucking great. <laughs> and he's like, this is insane. <laughs> uh, I get that a lot from my buddy, Sean, that runs a Viking boat now. I'm just like, shut up. You drive a, drive a school bus. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's funny. We're a, we're a special breed up here. I mean, we're, like the Cape May guys, 
they're even more hardcore than us because yeah. they got to run even farther every day. Like when they run to the Washington Canyon, we're like, oh man, it's 58 miles to the, you know, Northwest cor- Northeast corner. And they're like, it's 85 for yeah. them <laughs> yeah. to the corner of the Washington and you know, every day for them. I don't care where they go. It feels like it's a hundred miles every day. Like I'm Greenberg. How far are you? A hundred miles. I'm like, what? That's impossible. <laughs> hundred miles. No matter where we go, it's a hundred miles. Even like even the close canyons of them seem like it's it's, it's really far. Yeah. Like, I don't. Know. I think they. <laughs> so those guys, it's the same way. You know, anywhere you take those guys from Cape May and you drop them in the ocean somewhere, they're gonna be competitive and they're gonna kick ass because they work at it. They have to go farther. They have to fish longer. You know, we have a short season up here, so you got to get it while you can. Yeah. How with that with that sort of the way we we work or the way it is up here, how much do you think just having everything right on a constant basis goes into, you know, we can't like, you know, there's so many days where you, you know, somebody catches three and and I say you catch three and I catch one, which is typical, like, and you can't mess, you can't, you can't have a failure, can't have an an issue, you know, to, if you really care about, you know, obviously a lot of people don't care about catching a lot, but some people do. And like the difference, you know, the difference up here between being the top boat in the white Marlin open and the 10th boat in the white Marlin open is like a fish and a half or like two yeah, fish, you know, times, right. Yeah. And like, I, how many times have you heard me say tackle failure is not an option? Yeah. Like your shit has to be perfect. Like go the extra mile, take the extra time, go through every crimp, go through every leader, go through, you know, all your dredge stuff, check it twice, check it 10 times. And, and then repetition, like doing it over the same way every single time. Uniformity. Like Everything needs to be uniform. Like the same number of wraps on every Bimini twist for that line class. And and you know how I am with that stuff. Yeah. I just want it to be as deep. You have to be detail oriented. And then, you know, then that's one less factor that goes against you. Right. Yeah. And then the other thing is your people downstairs. Like the more days you can have the same people doing the same job on board, the more efficient you'll be and the better your average is going to be. You know, you find someone's strong suit and that's their position. Like if they're good on the left flat, if they're good on the right flat, if they're good on the left long uh, and then keeping everything simple, like no matter where we go, we pretty, pretty much fish the exact same spread, no matter where we're fishing. Yeah. And it, it works so far and we'll keep doing that. Uh, and I think that just helps with the efficiency and, you know, like I said, just having the same number of people and having the same anglers and, and building a team. It's about, it's all about a team. I mean, really, you know? Yeah. And you can, you can change people in and out and, and it won't affect you greatly, but it's still, as long as the rest of the team is cohesive and working together, which I know on some days that that's just not going to happen. <laughs> Sometimes the people downstairs are our biggest enemy. <laughs> I have a hard time figuring out what team they're on. Sometimes, sometimes I'm like, Whose team are you on? Today? Especially when they share your same last name, it becomes incredibly right. frustrating. <laughs> So are you working for the fish today or are you on our side? Like, come on, what are we doing? <laughs> That's funny. Um, I mean that, and that all trans translated into, you know, your incredible two season run over in Los Sueños where you won it twice in a row, right? Yeah. And we were one fish away from winning it the third year, <laughs> yeah. one fish, one Marlin. And we had, that we had a very bad streak of Marlin bites. We were five for 10 for the, the series on Marlins. And that is not acceptable. <laughs> You're not going to win when you catch half. Yeah. That just, it happens though. Like, you know, it's the law of averages. The two years before that, we were doing awesome. Like could do no wrong. Right. We were pulling fish off. We were catching multiples and, and we were constantly in the right spot. And a lot of that is luck. You know, you just, when everything goes your way, right. You know, yeah. I mean, you can do your best and you can be prepared. And like they always say, when preparation meets opportunity, you know, that's when you're going to, the best things are going to happen and you're going to win the third year in a row. I mean, it was, everything was, we were, we just weren't firing on all eight cylinders. You know, we just had some bad luck with, you know, staying tight on them and pulling fish off and hey, it happens. I remember fishing a couple of those tournaments with you or, or not with you, but against you. And remember saying uh, somebody on the boat saying, you're always like, you were always one of the first boats to catch a fish. And I was just, I was like, I never really noticed that, but you know, I've ever since I started fishing in ocean city over the course of the day, you'd be like, Oh, look, it's, you know, eight o'clock and the bill fishers got their first on. And it just kind of goes from there. Like how, I, I mean, I've always wanted to ask you, how do you figure that out? Like, do you, I mean, dude, like it was, I mean, this is, 
this is pre I don't know if it's luck. I mean, you it's like in Los Suenos, it was like, all right, 805 agitator. You know, it was it was like constantly. I mean, and it seems like you got to you got to start on that role when you in Los Suenos because of the way it is, how competitive it is, you know? Yeah. And and I think one of the things that helps with that is that we pre fished a lot. Right. So yeah. we had a pretty good idea of which way the fish were headed the night before. And I would always just try to, you know, and, and getting there early. Like, you know, I would get there early and ride around and we didn't have a sonar on that, yeah. on the agitator. We're all, and we were one of the slower boats. I mean, we're on the little engine that could, <clears throat> it was us in the Tar Heel. We'd get out there. I mean, we were like literally chomping at the bit to leave the dock while the observer is like trying to say hello. And I'm like, yeah. get on the boat. <laughs> and you know, we're motoring Boom! At, a, at a, our whopping 27 knot cruise. And the only guy I would ever pass on the agitator was the Tar Heel. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'd always, you know, we'd, get in the same area but in the morning you get there and you're looking at your conditions and when i'm running out in costa rica especially i'm spending the last 20 miles in my binoculars yeah i mean i'm on the ra- i'm looking at the radar i'm looking at the binoculars i'm looking at the conditions to see what has changed from the night before and when we i would run until i found a spot that you know until you see the fish like you know it's nice thing in costa rica is a lot of time there's way more sign there than there is here it seems like in the pacific overall if it's not happening on the surface you just need to keep on moving on because it's just not happening like if you run through the area that you had bites yesterday and it doesn't you don't see the sign yeah they are gone (laughs) and so i would just keep going until i mean i sometimes i would literally run around like a crazy person almost on the pins until it was like one minute to lines in. Yeah. And, and I would, or if I feel good about the conditions, I would slow down to like 15 knots and chug around at 15 knots to, I would go just fast enough that I felt like I, I would go fast enough to cover ground, but slow enough that I felt like I could mark a sail on my fish finder. Yeah. Yeah. So I'd motor around and then I'd be like, and when it would be like a couple minutes to go, I'd try to get a mark that I knew was a sail. <coughs> Excuse me. And then I would just turn and flop my stuff out right on top of them. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, I, I would see that mark and I'd time like, okay, I got two minutes to go. I need to turn down see now. Or I'd, I'd, you know, say, all right, well that fish is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'd slow down to eight knots and I'd make a lap and I'd mark him again. And I'd be like, okay, one minute to go. I need to turn right now and aim at him. And I'd kind of get their timing on which way they were moving with the tide and the current. So that as soon as it was lines in, we would have our stuff going out over him. And I'd be like, yeah. dump dredges. Okay. Wind them up. Okay, dump the riggers. And then we'd be like, I'm getting a bite. And I'd be like, yes, you know, that first one of the day, letting them out. Yeah. A couple times. And and this was like this, this kind of hurt the third year. Like we were saying, we won it two years in a row. And the third year it was the third leg. We were fishing out west. We were off Cabo Blanco. And it was kind of like a cloudy, choppy morning. And everybody stopped in, like just outside the blue dots. And I went like five or six miles. I went like kind of like right to the fence, you know. And because I like it there, like right 49 and a half. I feel like that's just a trade, but trade Ocean City trade is that you're always going to go further out. (laughs) So you can only go so far there. And that's kind of nice because that kind of puts a little bit of a choker on a dumb dumb like me that will go 100 miles if you let me, Uh, even though they're fish at 48 miles. Like, hey, it might be better 100 miles. It's always better over the next horizon. We we slow down and there was some white birds picking and a couple of boobies diving and I go up ski and I'm chugging along and, and we got like five minutes to go and I mark like a, a busload of them. And I was like, oh yeah, here we go. And no one's around me. And I was like, we're going to work on them for a little bit alone because nobody's going to get here in time. So were you up like, sea of, of everybody too? Or yeah. yeah, nice. So it's like one minute to lines and I turn down sea and I'm creeping along like six and a half knots and I'm like, okay, put them in. And I'm like, all right, we should mark them right here. And like, here they start coming across the screen. <laughs> And they're like, I'm getting a bite. I'm getting a bite. I'm getting a bite. So next thing, you know, it's one minute after lines in and we're holding four. Nice. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and we pulled all four of them off. Oh my God. The, so I, I'm, the, ad, the, I could not imagine the, the, the steam was coming out of my ears, but I didn't say steam. anything. It's I'm sure that it wasn't just you. <laughs> so we come around. I'm like, we're coming around. Get, like, so I chug us up. We're, you know, doing eight and a half knots plowing into it and they're like i'm getting a bite i'm getting a bite we're holding like three or four again and i'm like yes thank god catch one so i it was still the first fish of the day right yeah so i get on there and i'm like one fish for the agitator i that would if i was running a boat that would be 
my sign to be on my way. <laughs> and <laughs> Ashley goes on the radio and goes, John, first fish of the day. Why do you sound angry? <laughs> and I was like, because it should have been four. Oh, that was a mistake. Oh, uh, and that was just kind of how that year worked out. But hey, yeah. we did great. We had a great season. Uh, Bayless beat us. So if you're going to lose to somebody, that's a pretty good person to lose to. Yeah. Um, and yeah, our, you know, the Los Sueños tournaments, great tournaments, really super competitive. I haven't fished them in a, a few years. I wish I was going to get to go down and fish them all this year. But the boat will be there. You know, the new boat will be there. And Are, you, are they going to be fishing it? Yeah, they're going to fish the tournaments. Yeah. Cool. So it's cool. exciting. Nice. All right. And then I typically have a, 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 a question about like a day that, you know, it doesn't have to be your best day or or just a day that means a lot to you. But I'm going to I'm going to knock your options down to the day you, uh, you caught 57 whites in Ocean City. August 30th, 2010. Yeah, look, and- I, I brought my logbook. <laughs> oh, man. I have my logbook. And we can have a fireside chat. I mean, oh, my God. We, we got to do another one of these. Look, let me, oh, I can just open it. It was, up. now there was a, there was a, there, if I remember correctly, there was a, uh, a mathematical error that day. We really caught 58. 58 my yeah. mother caught it on the way home, but I had already told everybody we caught 57. So yeah. there was no way to go back on it. Yes, indeed. So here we have, it was August 30th, right? August 30th, 2010. 2010. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Yeah. So I have my log and how many bites and who was on board. So we started fishing at 8.08 a.m. And we immediately oh. missed one. <laughs> two minutes into the day. And then we raised a large blue marlin. And then we missed two more white marlin. <laughs> and then we saw two more white marlin that would not bite. Uh <laughs> and then it started off from there. I mean, you could see we caught a double. Then Your a brother double. kept on missing for a little bit. Oh, yes. Yes, we have that here. <laughs> there, miss. Oh, wait, but look who missed right after Jeremy. Me. Anthony. <laughs> and then you caught one and P caught one. And then dad and Jer caught. Then we caught a, f- a quad out of a five banger, then a five banger out of a six banger. And it just was like off to the races from there. Yeah. I just, I'll never forget. You. And I have right here, it says two for four or six could be a lot. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, you know, gosh, I mean, it just, it's page. It, it's a yeah. page ish. We went on and on. It was pretty awesome. But remember like afternoon, it would slow down to like singles, you know? We yeah. Were, much all singles but man the morning was incredible but by noon i mean the 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 record at the time was 27 and by noon i think we had 30 or something 33 or something like that and yeah that was pretty cool so you're asking about a special day so one really special day was uh it was in 2009 and it was just me and p and dad Ah, yeah and we caught 26 and the cerveza caught 27 that day and I, that, that's a pretty incredible day. You know, I mean, it was really just dad as the angler and P yeah. as me. And that's pretty incredible fishing for three people on board. And in the Pacific, another incredible day we had was just, it was me, Chris Horning, uh, mom and dad. And we were on the Tar Heel because it was before we had finished the little tater. So we, you know, we had shipped the Tar Heel down and we caught 85 sails in a blue and it was just mom and dad <laughs> as anglers. It's that incredible. was pretty epic day of fishing. And Chris kept coming upstairs and be like, can you believe this? Can you believe this? <laughs> uh, yes, Chris, I can believe it. Get back downstairs. We have to catch more. <laughs> and then um, I was going to ask you, I was asked to ask you about the grand, uh, about the big fish in last summer. I think I was, uh, what, what, is, what do you, what, what do you hold and or what 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 achievement means more to you? Catch a 57 in Ocean City or catching a grander? Because those are two two crazy things that doesn't happen very often, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh oh man. That's hard to answer because like you dream. I, I feel like people in Ocean City dream of both of those things and going out and having an incredible day with numbers and then finally running over because you know it's all possible, but it's very so very rarely happens. Yeah. That you know, like I mean, look, the, to catch that fish this summer was an incredible achievement it was i mean it's like getting hit by lightning you know the chance of that happening during a tournament yeah uh and then for everything to go right and for to kill it and skinny noah on the leader he was pu- even his hair was pulling <laughs> it was pretty awesome uh 
And especially in the shitty conditions we had to deal with. Yeah. And the freaking storms and everything. Yeah, lightning and rain and blowing its butt off. And it was, you know, that's miserable conditions to catch any fish in, let alone that. Yeah. And thankfully, it was on the right tackle. And uh, man, it's hard to pick. You know, both of those days are pretty incredible. I mean, you, you, it's pretty neat. You were there on the day we caught the 57. And, uh, you know, to always to have these things happen with my family and be able to do it all with my family and like with Bill and, yeah, yeah. you know, this summer, like we killed that fish. And I was like, I told P and Chris, I was like, man, I wish you guys would have been there too, you know, just to see it. Yeah. But yeah. We were like, we were running home and we ran by the real joy and Chris was on there and Andy yeah. was on there and Michael and John G and to, we like actually stopped and backed <laughs> over to him and they stopped during the third. We were like, look at this. <laughs> then we're running home and I'll get to great gull and who's fishing on great gull Prather. Yeah. So I stop and back over to him and I'm like, Pete, look at this. <laughs> That's pretty awesome, man. Yeah. I mean, just, really lucky to have gotten to do both of those things. I would say, you know, to be honest with you, the, the grant, the, the big blue Marlin this summer, man, I always thought nothing will ever top the day of catching all those Marlins. Yeah. But to be able to catch that fish this summer in the mid Atlantic, which I, you know, I love that tournament. Yeah. On, on, Friday, your, in on your new boat, on the boat that we built. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how cool is that? That's pretty cool, dude. Yeah. Uh, I told you on third member on third. I, yeah. I feel like I got one more in me. And I you feel said like be a good one. This is what I heard. You said, I don't really have anything to fish for. So I'm going to go to the Washington where there's a big white marlin swimming around. <laughs> That's what you said. As you said, you need to go out there and, and try to catch uh catch the Viking boat or something like that. Yeah. That was boy, that was they had that that one day. That was that an was, incredible day. I was, I was having a good day that day. And then I'm, he's, I'm like, what do you, what have you caught, Dooley? And he's like, uh, like 15 in a blue or 14 in a blue or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. What a great day on a, yeah. on a tournament. So. They had a great summer, you know, the Viking demo. And they, they, like, again, there's a team that they go hard at it every, <laughs> mm-hmm. time, every day they fish. I mean, they, those guys are, you know, they're methodical and they all have their position and they f- fish with the same anglers as much as they can. And, and they, they just perform, you know? And I think yeah. that's the basis of success for the style of fishing that you like, just like you guys. I mean, your team is, you guys are amazing. You know, I mean, you guys practice and you fish a lot and you, you know, it's taking a while, but yeah, it's getting there. It always takes a while. Yeah. None of it happens fast. I mean, we suck more often than we shine, but yeah. Hey, we try hard every day. Yep. So cool. And then let's talk about the 63 and Duffy boat works and that insanity that you got yourself into, which I think yeah. is, uh, takes a special, special breed for that. Mm-hmm. Lost my mind. Yeah. So what's what your philosophy, you know, cause I, I did a, did a pod yesterday with uh, Steve French and I was like, man, I just remember that 62, the 63 Spencer. I remember he was adamant about having it overbuilt and a certain weight to me, to, to be able to, to, to ride in shitty weather, you know? And I mean, yeah. the, the 63 is built in the same philosophy and I'm, I feel like even my boat, the, the case in that I run is uh, built in the same kind of mindset. And how, how important do you think that is that? I mean, I would rather it be overbuilt. <laughs> Look, Tony diesel that works with me. He's he, and he used to run the boat that you run. Yeah. He always says, no one ever calls you to tell you that it stayed together. <laughs> That's right? a, yeah. Really call when there's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully no one will ever call. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I would rather it be overbuilt. I mean, it's, it's when we were building the Spencer boat, Paul was great about letting us do some of the stuff we wanted to do. Like we wanted a little bit longer cockpit. We wanted a little more shape in the transom. Uh, we wanted more glass on the boat. We knew we were going to build it a little heavier, but we were putting 1800 horsepower cats in it at the time. That's a lot of horsepower in a 62 yeah. Yeah. And we knew we were going to travel extensively and we knew we were going to charter fish. So I was like, man, let's just overdo it. Whatever glass you normally put on there, put another layer on. Put another yeah. layer in the hull sides. Let's glass the inside of the hull twice instead of once. And uh, yes, we probably left a little bit of speed on the table, but the boat was plenty fast. Yeah, that was incredibly and fast. An amazing boat. And then uh, when when we set out to build the boat <coughs> that we finished the summer, you know, I said, I wanted to take everything we had in the boats we've had before and everything that I've learned from running the boat for 20 years. And I wanted to have more fuel, better range. You know, I wanted to have at least the same size cockpit, if not a little bigger. I wanted to build a boat that I knew I could take fishing anywhere, anytime. And, you know, my family's always on the boat. So to keep them safe and, and feel like, you know, we're, we're never going to worry about the boat. 
Yeah. So my philosophy for the construction of the boat was overdoing it is better than under, you know, is, is the only option really for me. I always want to build boats that I know that they, they should last generations, you know? And I always say, I want someone to cut this boat open in 50 years and look in there and be like, wow, look at how this is put together, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I think we've accomplished that. I think that the boat, you know, we probably left some speed on the table. I mean, consistently we're like 43, 43 and a half knots wide open. Which is really fast for most people other than your brother. <laughs> right. But, we, you know, we were spoiled. The, the last boat was fast. I mean, yeah, she, yeah. she was 46, 46 and a half knots every day. Uh, this is a lot different boat though. I mean, it's, it's wider, it's bigger. It's, it, you know, we're, we're pushing 93,000 pounds on the normal day fishing. Yeah fully loaded. She's like 96,000 pounds. Uh, but we hold a lot of fuel. We're 2175 in fuel. We're 405 in fresh water. We have three staterooms, three heads, the tackle room, freezer. So I feel like it's rigged out, you know? It's a, it, it was astonishing to me, the difference between the case in the room downstairs versus the case in your boat. Cause they're, they're quite similar. Yeah. I mean, they're quite, they're, dim, their length is quite similar, but they're not similar. Your boat has a huge cockpit. Like, yeah, got it's, yeah, it's a lot of cockpit, big salon. Yeah. And I just found that the room downstairs, it's completely like that. That was the biggest contrast I found and in, in the headroom and the engine room. But I just, yeah. I mean, you know, because we have the broken shear and, and I like a big proud bow and the boat is a, a little more, of a traditional style Carol, you know, Carolina style boat. Uh, so it's a little taller than most boats that are being built right now, but I'm okay with that. I like that bigger, proud, like kind of like aggressive profile. Uh, yeah. and that gave us uh, the ability to have more headroom in the engine room. And, uh, gosh, I mean, how can you fault somebody for being able to get completely around the motors it's... underneath the motors and work on every pump and not have to be, you know, a contortionist to get anywhere in the boat? Yeah. There's plenty of room to work on everything. And like, you know, there's still plenty of interior volume. Uh, yeah, we probably could have sleeked the boat out a little more and we could have lowered the profile. There's a, like, <laughs> I always say like, you know how you hear people say, oh, I'd change a million things. Yeah. I would change 999,999. <laughs> so, hey, that's not a million. So we're yeah. doing our, on the next one. Maybe we'll you change even less. I'm sure, I'm sure that'll be the case. So, well, cool, Johnny. I greatly appreciate it. Um, greatly appreciate the time and yeah, man. it was a good time, man. So I appreciate it. Yeah. You've uh, done a lot for me and my family. And yeah. so I greatly appreciate it. And the reason I, I mean, the reason why we fish the way we do on the blood money is because of you people. So for, <laughs> for better and for worse, for better or worse. <laughs> So, that's awesome. So. I mean, you guys do an incredible job. I'm really proud of you. I think you've, you know, you're doing an amazing job for those guys on there. You're a hell of a competitor. And now, I mean, all the time I'm like, where's Anthony? We got to get where Anthony is. He knows where to go. I don't know where I'm going anymore. I'm never out here. <laughs> it's like, yeah, oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I hope, you know, I've always wanted, that's the first question is like, if I don't know where you ask, where the Bill Fisher's at. Ad, I'm, I'm asking, you know, he just got to, you know, you might be in the right spot, but they could be in the right spot. You know, it's, it's not going to be far off. So, yeah, so. I always feel that when I see you guys there, I'm like, all right, blood money's here. <laughs> that's how I, that's the same way. You watch somebody this. <laughs> well, cool, man. I appreciate right, so it. Thanks a lot. Stop.